Okay, good morning. I think we're ready. Uh, just a, a quick announcement. We are going to have a little bit of a, um, I guess, format change at the end. We'll be breaking up into groups to take comments and to answer questions. So at the end, once we complete the meeting, we'll go to that. We'll try it out, see how it goes. Um, we do uh, ask you to keep any comments you might have, uh, send them in via email or take them to our board meeting that's coming up on what date, Amanda? Okay, there we go. So on the CSA board meeting about uh, any format requests or changes or ideas or thoughts that come up from uh, this meeting this morning. So with that, we'll start out and get to the agenda. We'd like to welcome uh, Mr. Steve Coe. Steve Coe is the lead architect for the new fire station project here that's gonna be going on in uh, Sea Pine. Steve, come on up. Good morning. How is everyone? I wanna thank you for the opportunity to be here. Um, first and foremost, I uh, wanna thank the town of Hilton Head for, for us, my firm does a lot of fire station design and uh, really believe that fire stations are a pretty unique building type. Um, very interesting, You've, it's sort of a house, it's not sort of a house. Uh, there's a lot of health issues and things like that, but to keep firemen safe, but more importantly, in a lot of ways, a fire station is a community building that marks the identity of that community. And they don't happen too often, as you know. So this station replacing an existing station, the uh, image of that, we, we really take strongly, uh, feel it's very important. So I've got a quick PowerPoint that I can show you what the new building will look like, and then a little video that kind of flies around it. Um, and I'm happy to answer any questions if the format allows. So <clears throat> um, again, we are going to be removing or replacing the existing fire station that's there. Um, with a new 8,300 square foot three bay fire station. So, ready? So I think you know the existing building. Um, again, that will be demolished. And the next slide, it's the location right next to sort of where we are here. Uh, building will be on the same site. Next. So this is the existing footprint. It's currently on site. That station has been there for many, many years. This shows the new station and the outline of the existing building. So it is a little bit bigger. Um, the issues we have to deal with now are flood. So the uh, living areas of this station are all, all elevated above the floodplain. Uh, any occupied space that is below the floodplain is floodproofed. So if there is a storm coming, they will put up floodgates and that will uh, protect those spaces that are below flood. Uh, the station also has um, some golf cart charging stations. I know for various events that are on site um, and parking in the back of the station. Next. So these next slides show the what the building looks like. This is from the main road. Uh, you see the three bays on the left and a new entry on the right. Next. That's the back of the station. And so that's the, it's a drive-through station. So they will um, return to the station in the back and then drive out through the front. Uh, the rooms on the left are all of the bunk rooms and you see the entry. This is the right-hand side, sort of the farthest away from where we are here, um, sort of secluded. You don't really see a lot of that. The portion that you see sticking out towards you are support spaces. Um, so tool storage and uh, other storage areas, and then the main entry. And so you see there is a set of stairs and a ramp uh, because we are up about seven, six or seven feet from what I remember to be above floodplain. So hopefully this works. So this is a video uh, that we developed that shows as you're driving past the station, and it's always good when the computer works, so that's great. And the colors are not finalized yet. Um, we, we still need to do that with sea pines and just be sure everything is approved. But you see the apparatus bays there on the left. This is the main entry. 
main entry tower and stair uh, ramp. Driving around the back, there are generators for emergency power. So this building will run on 100% emergency power in the event of a storm or a power outage. And that's the back of the station. So I'd be happy to, oh, the other thing I didn't mention, uh, the building is being designed. Um, have any of you heard of LEED? It's a sustainability. So it is a green building and this will be getting LEED certification. Um, so we are, I think, earmarked for LEED Silver. The last three LEED projects we've done that were earmarked for LEED Silver, we actually were able to attain LEED Gold through the process. A lot of that process, it's a two-part process. So during the design, we pick materials and design the building for lighting and energy efficiency. And then there's a second part that the contractor has to fulfill in order to meet those requirements. And we, on the last several projects we've done, through the working with the contractor, we were able to attain a higher level of LEED certification, which is, you know, it's a good thing. It's stewards, uh, being great stewards of the land, your tax money, uh, energy efficient buildings, they actually, uh, daylighting and those types of things help morale, help health of the occupants. So it's a very good, good process to go through. Be happy to take any questions. microphone so we can hear. Okay. Where will the fire trucks and the firemen be in the interim? Great question. So they, there is a temporary station that the town has already bid out and has a contractor. They are holding the signing of that contract or the authorization for it to proceed until we receive bids on this. Our project is out for bids right now. The actual location of that Julian Walls might be able to answer that better than me. Good morning. Uh, Julian Walls, facilities manager for the town of Hillhead. The, the temp gonna... station is actually right next door. It's going to be at uh, Suite 124. So There's going to be a Suite 124, and we just signed a contract with <laughs> Kenneth. You're going to hold it or use it? I'm okay. Can everyone hear me? No, you're on a recording. They can't hear you. Sorry. Sorry about that. Uh, the, the temp station is going to be at suite 124, which is right next door. Uh, we just uh, initiated a contract with Kenneth Scott Builders. Uh, it is basically going to be a, a blank canvas and it's going to have bunk rooms, uh, a kitchen, uh, uh, a bathroom, and then the trucks are going to be stored in the rear of this building. Uh, and that's, that's basically about it. Yes, ma'am. Okay, so the project currently is out for bid, and it's a 30-day bid period, and I think bid the bid receipt is November 26th, I believe. By the time the bids are certified and contracts and those types of things, it's likely to be the beginning of 2020, and it is a 420-day, a little over a year duration. That includes the demolition and the new construction, so roughly, you know, if we start in January, we're talking March of 2021. Yes, sir. Will the new building have any uh, solar power? The question was, will the new building have any solar power? It does not. Um, we did not, it's not one of the, uh, so LEED has a whole series of criteria, water efficiency, energy efficiency, lighting, daylight, recycled materials. And you sort of look at the project as a whole and try and see what's the best way for to achieve to achieve the number of points we need, but also do that in a fiscally responsible manner. And solar power wasn't something that we needed to pursue in order to get the number of points we needed for silver. So, yes. There are trees there now. Are there going to continue to be trees there? There are trees that will remain. Majority of them do remain, and we have a landscaping plan. Actually, the video, which showed, if you saw, there were quite a number of uh, plantings and existing trees. Existing trees mainly stay. I, th I think we might be taking out one or two, but they're not grand trees. But we do have a landscaping plan that meets all of the regulations and requirements that we need to. Good question. Um, what's the total cost, and is it shared with the town of Hilton Head, or does Seat Pines bear the whole cost? 
the cost estimate for this building uh, and the history on this, by the way, um, you know, we designed this building in 2015 and it went out for bids. The bids came in a somewhat high, but then there were also, you may remember, you had a few little hurricane problems. So the funding, I believe, for the hurricanes took up some of the funding away from the station. Um, and so it sat for a while, but the estimate, I believe the last estimate we had, which escalated it through the midpoint of construction was somewhere in the neighborhood about three and a half to $4 million for the construction of the building. My understanding is town of Hilton Head is paying that Steve. Again, thank you very much. We're excited about this. Thanks. Thanks, Julian. Okay, Amanda, are you up? <laughs> Actually, you're paying for the fire station through your taxes. Good morning. My name is Amanda Sutcliffe-Jones. I'm your CSA Director of Communications. Uh, thank you for joining us this morning at the Sea Pines Community Call Fame. Uh, we do have uh, lots of agenda items to cover, so I'll move through mine quickly. Some upcoming uh, events that you should be aware of. If you are available this Friday, we are having a Medicare event here in this room. It'll be from 10 to 12 p.m. and uh, come to hear about all things Medicare. So certainly something to, to look into if you're interested. We do have tickets available um, just to make sure we have enough seats for everybody. You can sign up through our website, cpinesliving.com backslash events to register for a ticket uh, for that meeting if you're interested. David will speak about the bonfire, but just save the date. It's uh, coming up this week on Friday, so David will speak more about that. Another upcoming event is the US 278 Gateway Corridor Committee Community Presentation. They're coming to Sea Pines, so it's very important if you're available to attend this meeting that you try to do so. It'll be on Wednesday, November 13th, and uh, it's at 10 o'clock in the morning here in the community center. We'll hear from the committee chairman and the project manager who is overseeing the 278 corridor project. So a bid project that's coming up. Uh, so if you're interested, please plan to attend. And then we have a community shredding event on the uh, November 14th uh, at 8 a.m. So put that on your calendar if you have any materials that you need to shred. Uh, you can have staples, you can have paper clips, but if you have it in binders, you do have to take the material out of the binders before it can be shredded. And they do shred on site. So if you have items, uh, feel free to bring them. We just ask that you don't bring commercial quantities um, to, the, to the shredded event, please. The ASPO board meeting, uh, that's, this was on Brett's screen earlier, but the CSA board meeting and ASPO board meeting are coming up soon. ASPO's meeting is on the 14th of uh, November, so Thursday the 14th seems like a busy day for us, doesn't it? Uh, 9 a.m. here in the community, uh, in community center. CSA's board meeting is on the 19th, which is Tuesday at 3 p.m. We also have our CSA holiday hours posted. This is our Thanksgiving office hours. You'll see our Christmas and New Year's Eve office hours posted as well. These office hours here apply specifically to the admin office. Uh, from a gate perspective for passes and gate issuance, those are not affected by um, holiday hours, but these are our office hours for the CSA admin office located at 175 Greenwood Drive. Uh, David will speak about the 2019 property owner open house event that we have coming up at Tower Beach. So I'll um, leave that for David's slides. But I did want to make sure people were aware we have the Wreaths to Cost America event coming up. That's going to be on December 14th. So save the date for that at noon. It's a really special event for us. So uh, the staff at CS, or excuse me, Six Oaks works really hard with Wreaths to Cost America to place a wreath on every veteran's grave that's in the, um, in the cemetery. If you would like to participate, you can assist with that process of the wreath laying. If you're interested in uh, making a donation to actually purchase a wreath, you can do so as well. The wreaths themselves are $15, and for every two wreaths purchased, uh, Wreaths Across America actually donates an additional wreath for free. So it's a great way to, to celebrate those folks who served our country. If you're interested, you can um, make the donation there at the bottom. Wreaths Across America, but you do send it to Six Oaks, and we work directly with Wreaths Across America to facilitate that event for us. 
You can see our Christmas and holiday office hours for New Year's as well. Uh, Jean and I will make sure this information goes out in our regular mass email communications and it is posted on our website, but just be aware of those upcoming events. Some information about the CSA and ASPO Board of Director elections. There are three seats open, three seats for the CSA Class A Board of Directors and three seats open for the ASPO Board of Directors. Your ASPO Board candidates are David Ellis, Dana Gazzo, and Grover Todd. For your CSA Class A Residential Board Directors, Diedrich Avercott, Dave Borghese, David Ellis, David Pardew, and Bob Quinn. Quick show of hands in the audience. Uh, can you raise your hand if you've received your ballots? That's amazing. That makes me feel so good. <laughs> Yay. There's only like 195,000 pieces of paper. So, you know, just a few, just a few. Um, so a little bit of information on the ballots. They did get mailed from the, um, from the printer on November 1st. So if you haven't gotten yours yet, uh, hang tight. We do ask to give it a couple of days for it to receive to you and your mailing. If you are in Sea Pines and you usually get your mail in Ohio or, you know, California or wherever you may have another property, do let it do give it a couple of days but if you are not where you're you know intending to receive your mail please reach out to us so we can get that reposted to you if you are international we do have some international owners in sweden and canada and even one in africa i think so that might take a little while to get to you um but but do certainly reach out to staff if you have any concerns if you have any questions we're here for you this um item was included in your um, ballot mailing package just as your return envelope you don't have to use your return envelope it just has to go to the right place uh, that's elliot davis they're located in charleston south carolina i've got that question a couple times already is that does it have to be the special blue envelope it does not um, but just as long as it gets back to elliot davis in charleston that's our ballot administrator for this project for us and again, ballots must be postmarked by December 1st, 2019 in order to be counted by Elliott Davis. Please be cognizant that December 1st is a Sunday. Post offices are not usually open on Sundays, so just make sure that you're posting it um, before uh, that timeline. So December 1st is that due date for postmark. Again, if you have any questions, you can contact us at the office, you can stop by, you can email us, and we'll be happy to assist you. So where do you learn more about your candidates? Uh, if you received your CSA packet, this is your candidate handout. So this information would be posted in your candidate brochure. Uh, the CSA ballot is yellow. There are three open spots and five candidates running. So you would make three votes for this, um, for the CSA ballot. And then for your ASPO ballot, similarly, your candidate handout was included. And then there are three open seats and three, open, or three candidates running for ASPO. Um, please be cognizant that ASPO membership is voluntary. You don't have to be a member of CPINES, so you may not have received ASPO if you're not a current member for 2019. You had to have paid your dues for ASPO to receive your ASPO package. Again, information about the candidates and where to find information is posted on our website. So we ask that you certainly uh, cast your vote and participate in this year's election. If you are an ASPO member, in your package, you also would have received your bylaw vote. So that information for the ASPO bylaws was part of that package. That's actually part of their ballot as well. So it's one ballot with two votes, one for the ASPO Board of Director elections, and the second part of that ASPO ballot is the bylaw votes. So if you guys have any questions, certainly reach out to staff and we'll be happy to help you. Uh, just a quick reminder on how you contact CSA or how you update your information. You can reach out to us by phone, you can come visit us in the office, or you can email our general inbox, which is info at csacpines.com. At this time, I'd like to welcome David Henderson, our Director of Special Projects and Operations. David. Thank you. Thank you, Amanda, and good morning. I'm going to touch uh, yet again on the uh, beach and boardwalks and <clears throat> kind of update uh, from the last coffee as to where we were. As you may recall, there was a moratorium post hurricanes that was put on the rebuilding of beach boardwalks within the Beach Trust, and that moratorium was lifted on May 1st of this year. Uh, we have uh, sent information on how owners who desire to rebuild boardwalks should proceed. And we have done an assessment of all the boardwalks that are currently existing within the Beach Trust. 
we have about 10 applicants now that have either received approval or are navigating through the approval process. Uh, one of the challenges that we've been working through is that we discovered that there were a lot of uh, what are referred to as existing non-compliant structures, and these were typically decks, and the current owner may have ha uh, inherited it from the previous owner who may have inherited it from the previous owner, but these are decks. Some are in the beach trust, some are not. So we're working to do the best that we can with the owners and with the regulatory authorities. This is primarily the town and the state, uh, OCRM, to see if we can get them compliant. So we're trying to get uh, them compliant after the fact. But at the end of the day, the purpose of the policy and the purpose of why we are doing what we are doing is to protect the integrity of the dunes. So if we can protect the integrity of the dunes, uh, we would have accomplished our mission, but we are assisting owners uh, with this process and working on an individual basis as these existing non-compliant structures come to our attention. Tower Beach Water Tower. Any of you frequent flyers here at the coffee know that uh, I've been talking about this for oh, over just over a year now. And uh, I know that some of you have been impacted with your cell coverage, particularly in the Tower Beach area, also at the other tower location, which is just down the road here near the intersection of Plantation and Lighthouse Road. And there has been slow progress uh, over the last some months. And uh, we've actually taken a step forward and then we proceeded then to take two steps back. And when I say we, it's it's not CSA, the tower is owned by South Island Public Service District, but in the case of Tower Beach, there are four wireless providers that have antennas on top of that tower. And I've, as I've shared with you in the past, uh, wireless communication companies don't do a very good job of communicating. Um, I see Lee, Lee over here knows all what I'm talking about, which is somewhat ironic, but it is what it is. And and they they operate independently of one another. So instead of moving four sets of antennas at one time, you have a contractor that represents X provider and they go through the process and they'll move their antenna and then provider Z comes in and they do the same thing. So Verizon had uh, moved back from the temporary tower to the, the cell tower uh, early on, then Sprint came in and it took AT&T time to come around, but they're finally here. If you've been to Tower Beach the last couple of weeks, you've seen that big lift that's just parked and idle, uh, but that's AT&T's. And the reason why it is parked and idled is that they have to wait for conflicts that were created by Verizon and Sprint putting their antennas back where they went. It's a little bit difficult to see, but if you see at the top of the water tower, you can see a few of the white antennas have been installed, and then you can see a few more posts where the antennas have not been installed. These are numbered and by contract between the provider and the public service district, their antennas in order for that individual provider to get their optimal coverage has to be in a very specific location. So AT&T shows up, they need to be at X, Y, and Z and find out that someone's at X and someone's at Y and they can't get to Z. So they have to wait for the two providers that reinstall their antennas to correct the conflict there was a lot of going back and forth, and one of the reasons why I've deduced and I, um, is that I think they may have been working off of different maps in that as these towers, these, these posts are noted and numbered, okay? So it's been a kind of comedy of errors, but I wanted to let you know where we were. AT&T is on site. As soon as the conflicts are resolved, they are there. Uh, T-Mobile, who we have not heard from in a while, they are now in the market, and they are waiting for AT&T to do their thing. So if we can get the conflicts resolved, hopefully resolution will be pretty pretty uh, shortly thereafter, and I won't have to talk about this in December, but we'll see. Amanda had mentioned the uh, Holiday Open House. We've been doing this for some years now. It's a great event. If you've never been to it, I'd encourage you to attend. It is at Tower Beach. It's Tuesday, December 10th, 3 to 6 p.m. We'll have a, a variety of uh, appetizers, beer and wine. Parking is somewhat limited at Tower Beach. We will communicate between now and then, but we encourage you to carpool if you are going to attend, to, white, to walk or bike if you could. And we'll have overflow parking at Parcel 1, which is that empty lot near the entrance to Lands Inn. And we will be providing trolley service uh, from that overflow lot to Tower Beach. So mark your calendars, and we'd like to see you on Tuesday, December 10th. Forest Preserve update. So our annual solicitation letter, this is the single largest 
source of funds that we get, and we send a letter out to you, the owners, and through your generosity, uh, we get almost half uh, from that letter of our annual operating budget. Uh, we were we are late getting it out this year. It normally would have been out earlier in uh, October, but we do anticipate the letter going out in the next week. So please keep an eye out for that. And if you do not get a letter, let's say within two weeks, and you are in a position or you are interested in giving, you can either stop by CSA or let me uh, know. But we do ask that you uh, continue su uh, supporting our natural treasure. I have a picture up there. Uh, some of you may have remembered the trials and tribulations of what refers uh, or rhymes to with with Chitty Chitty Bang Bang. So it rhymes with Chitty Chitty Bang Bang. And that was our old tractor that you see in the background there. And we, we have been uh, coaxing and loving her along. And we knew that we were going to need a new tractor, which is a significant purchase, uh, especially for the Forest Preserve. As luck would have it, I'd gotten approval from the Forest Preserve trustees, and this is pure coincidence, on October 8th to make the purchase. There were some year-end incentives that the dealer was having that made it uh, advantageous for us to go ahead and purchase as, a, as opposed to waiting to next year. So I received that approval from the trustees on the 8th. And on Wednesday, the 9th of October, my phone rings and it's Austin, who's pictured here as our forest preserve ranger, uh, to report that, that Chitty Chitty Bang Bang had, had died. <laughs> so the timing was good. I'm going to talk about the bonfire here in just a minute, and if you are able to go, and I and I hope that you that you can, we still have tickets available. Uh, I'm planning on giving a, a little bit of a ode to Chitty Chitty Bang Bang <laughs> because I think she's worthy of it. And I'll just give you a few teasers here. Uh, she was purchased in 1990 by CSA for nine thousand dollars. Now keep in mind, CSA was formed in 1988, so this is likely one of the first new pieces of equipment that CSA purchased. And here we are in 2019. So she uh, she served with honor and distinction. I don't get the tractor time now that I used to, but I personally have spent cumulative, cumulatively probably weeks sitting and riding and mowing on Chitty Chitty Bang Bang. So she, she has a place in my heart as well. But she died when the, when the clutch on her mowing deck failed which caused her internal gears that run the PTO to become obliterated. And while it could be fixed, it just isn't uh, cost efficient. Um, in lieu of flowers, contributions may be made to the Sea Pines Forest Preserve Foundation. But here we are with our shiny new John Deere that has been purchased. Hopefully it will serve as, as long and as with distinction as a Chitty Chitty Bang Bang. And in case you're asking, no, the new tractor does not have a name yet. It's something that takes time. You got to get to know them and, and kind of see how, you know, see how it goes. But there's Austin and you can't tell uh, probably from where you're sitting, but he is uh, he's grinning from ear to ear. He's about as excited as he can be over a new tractor. Donations and applications for the name. Hey, I'm, I'm all about it. <laughs> I'm all about it. The, uh, the tractor was almost $31,000. So it, it is, a again, a significant purchase, and it is especially a significant purchase for the Forest Preserve. That's, that's a great idea. Have a contest. Um, along the lines of raising funds, we also have our 2020 calendar. It is now available, and I'd like to give a shout out to James Hartley Smith, Jim. It would not be possible without him. Uh, this is our 11th edition, and for every single one of those 11 years, Jim has graciously taken photos. All the photos that are featured in the calendar the, were taken by Jim and were taken in the Forest Preserve. So they are available for purchase. They are $10 at CSA. When you get your annual solicitation letter, if you give at the steward level to $75 or up, you will receive a copy of the calendar. So I wanted to do a Thank Jim for all that, and he does a great job. All right, the bonfire, it's this Friday, 4.30 to 7.30. Great event, a menu by Salty Dog. We talked about the menu last time. It's a just diverse, wonderful menu. We are keeping our eye on the forecast. We are going to have the event. We would really like to have it at Fish Island and the Forest Preserve, and that is our intent. But if Mother Nature forces our hand, we'll have to go inside. But the event will be held. The backup location is to be determined. It's either going to be the um, gymnasium at the prep school or it's going to be here 
at the community center. But we will do everything we can if Mother Nature allows us to, uh, to have it outside. If any of you attended the spring event, the Party in the Pines, uh, you may remember that we had a downpour less than two hours before the event started. And as some of the early birds began arriving, we were still setting up tables and pitting linens on tables and pitting out chairs, but we pulled it off. So we'll do what we can to make sure that uh, we're able to host it at that great venue out of Fish Island. And again, tickets are still available. All right, that's all I had. I appreciate your attention. I'll go ahead and turn it over to uh, Russell Fredericks, who is your Director of Maintenance. Thank you. Thank you, David. Good morning. Good to see everybody. Cannot believe that this uh, season has breezed by so quickly. We've been uh, really bu been busy out there uh, since the spring, working on our new boardwalks, 12 in total uh, that were damaged during Hurricane Matthew. Um, we just finished our, our last boardwalk in the, in the last week or so. Um, we have some uh, additional work we're doing on number 22 uh, tomorrow. Uh, but all in all, our contractor did a great job, and I hope everyone's enjoying these new boardwalks. Uh, quite a bunch of these are a bunch uh, longer than they were before, uh, due to the, the fact of all the sand accumulation on the beach. Um, but again, uh, happy that uh, we were able to complete all this work this summer. North Sea Pines Leisure Trail. Um, many of you probably bike your bike your way over to the Beach Club. Uh, we widened this leisure trail uh, from Beach Lagoon Road to the Beach Club to accommodate all that heavy bike traffic over in that area. Uh, there's also two asphalt pull-off pads that we installed to allow bikers and pedestrians to pull off uh, to safety and allow the, the uh, bikers who are continuing on to the beach club to make their way through. Uh, as many of us know, uh, a lot of folks are going to the beach club with those three-wheeled bikes now. Uh, again, this wider pathway will accommodate that additional use. Plantation Drive Leisure Trail, uh, we executed this work uh, within the last week or so. We have some follow-up work to do um, in a couple areas to, uh, to level off some asphalt, but again, we uh, started at Greenwood Drive, made our way, way down to Inland Harbor. Uh, there's an additional section of Leisure Trail from Inland Harbor to Lighthouse Road that we will complete as part of the right Lighthouse Road uh, resurfacing project in order to tie in that asphalt as that uh, section of Leisure Trail is gonna be reconfigured as it comes to Plantation Drive. Again, um, up at the uh, CSA building or CSA admin building area of uh, Plantation Drive Leisure Trail, there's a, you see this kiosk here, we'll be installing a uh, brick paver pull-off uh, in front of this kiosk to improve access. Uh, that will be happening in the beginning of December. Uh, we'll be also installing some landscaping in proximity to uh, that area to improve the aesthetics. Uh, so again, that will be uh, happening pretty quickly. Uh, just a quick update on town of Hilton Head um, stormwater projects. We've been working with the town closely um, this season uh, and they've completed a whole bunch of work out there. Most importantly on the control structures that are essential for the operation of a lagoon system and stormwater, Oyster Landing, Red Pond, Banner Cove, Banner Park Road, and they're currently working on the Lawton uh, pump station. I have a couple pictures to show you of work in progress there. And they also completed repairs on Mizamass Court, substantial deterioration in the drainage pipes there, and the same on Ruddy Turnstone. Uh, we're working with the town on uh, Canvas Back Road as well. Uh, there's several failures in the beach walk and the Canvas Back Road, as many residents there know. Um, so I'm waiting for an update on the town on that as, as term, in terms of uh, timing. Just a couple pictures from Lawton Pump Station. You see here on the right, this is uh, one of the pumps that was taken out for uh, further evaluation. There's three pumps in total. Uh, and this is the uh, pump chamber here. Uh, so this is essential dur during the big storm events uh, for sea ponds. Uh, this pumps an enormous amount of water out of the Lawton Canal out to the outfall and out to Calabogie Sound. So again, this is critical for the operations of uh, stormwater, um, especially during a hurricane or something like that. So the town's currently working on repairs and more to come. Uh, these pumps um, are, as you can see here, they're very large and they're attached to, um, you see here, there's a concrete wall that they're attached to. 
And so those repairs will um, hopefully be happening very soon. Lighthouse Road, uh, work has started off a little bit slow. We're working down in Harbor Town in the parking lot. Uh, we've had several pipe failures down there on the old corrugated uh, gel, uh, pipe down there. Uh, there was currently three pipe failures that we came across. Uh, so again, work is starting down there and then we'll be progressing up the roadway uh, towards Plantation Drive. Uh, we've mentioned before, we're projecting about 12 weeks on to uh, complete this work and we're already about a week or so into the project. Uh, and you can see here, um, you know, we have some of the tree protection up and this is our first excavation. And again, this is probably 19, I would say 1960s uh, drainage pipe that we're working with down here that's completely deteriorated. Uh, some of the original drainage pipe that's in Sea Pines is down in Harbor Town. Uh, and some of this is Orangeburg, and again, most of it's this galvanized aluminum pipe that's completely deteriorated and has to be replaced. Uh, and goal, some just project goals, resurfacing the road, stabilizing the roadbed, and select areas and imp improving traffic flow and safety and, and uh, increasing drainage efficiency. Just a quick update on our grounds maintenance. Uh, many of you have seen bright view on the property. Um, they started here on November 1st uh, and are transitioning in quite well. Uh, we have a lot of work to do on the grounds um, between now and the holidays. Uh, our first flower change out with Brightview is scheduled for the second and third week in November. Uh, and that process should take about one to two weeks. I did want to mention something additional on road resurfacing. Um, outside the community, Palmetto Bay Road is scheduled to be resurfaced from the Fraser Bridge to Sea Pine Circle. It's an SCDOT project um, and it's slated to start November 15th. Uh, I'm not sure how long it's gonna take. I'm trying to find out more information. Again, Palmetto Bay Road from Fraser Circle to and around Sea Pine Circle is scheduled to be resurfaced by DOT. So um, more to come on that. Yes. Oh, excuse me, Sea Pine Circle, that's what I meant. Sorry about that, sir. Um, holiday displays, um, our contractors, and we have a new display this year, um, both at Sea Pines and Fraser Circle, not Fraser Bridge, um, that uh, we'll be working on. Uh, They've already completed the installation. Uh, so that's uh, already in progress, and you'll be seeing that we're looking to turn on the holiday display is probably the week before Thanksgiving. Uh, so again, that's uh, so new exciting holiday displays to see in Sea Pines this season. And I have uh, one more slide I wanted to share and, and it has nothing to do with Sea Pines, but you know, we all love our pets and you know, I've had, this is my second dog I've had. And you know, our, our pets get into all sorts of trouble and I guess about a year ago, I was talked into a Boykin Spaniel. And this Boykin Spaniel, he gets into all kinds of stuff on a daily basis. And he likes rooting around in the laundry. Oh, they switched the slide on me. Hold on a second. <laughs> and he came, out of the he came out of the laundry basket with this hanger around his head. I said, what the heck do you do? Anyway, I wanted to share that. Uh, He's two years old now, but he has a propensity for the laundry basket. Uh, uh, just one more co uh, comment. Um, open space mulching is in progress. Uh, we've started on Plantation Drive and plan to uh, go on to Sea Pines Drive and Lighthouse Road over the upcoming weeks. Uh, so again, our in-house staff will be working on that. And again, you can see Plantation Drive, we're about a third of the way down or so right now. So. Um, with that, I just wanted to take this opportunity to wish everyone a very happy Thanksgiving, a uh, happy, safe, and a blessed Thanksgiving as it's uh, coming up in a couple weeks. And with that, I'm gonna turn this over to Victoria Shanahan, our Director of Finance and Administration. Thank you. Good morning. I don't have any good dog stories today, sorry. 
Um, Hurricane Matthew credit. We uh, we cut it off as of October 31st, and we had left over $693,824 remained unspent. So I am still running the calculations, but your credit for an improved lot will be anywhere between $100 and $120, and for an unimproved lot, anywhere between $60 and $70. And also the commercial entities will also be receiving their credit. That credit will show up on your 2020 assessment invoice. And that's it. Okay, so, so assessments are be mailed out probably in December, and we do the first week in January. We haven't determined the amount yet, still based on CPI. I anticipate probably around a thousand ninety-five dollars for an improved lot, and six seventy for an unimproved. Okay, just let me know if you have any questions. Happy Thanksgiving to everyone. Good morning. Uh, I did talk with the town of Hilton Head. They did promise that the Fraser project would take a lot longer than what they anticipated, and it will be just as smooth as the project on Pope Avenue. So, <clears throat> um, this past month, we have had uh, 2,248 calls for service. Um, since my last time up here, we've had two burglaries. Uh, they were non-forcible burglaries that occurred here on property. Uh, both the property owners were away for an extended period of time, came back and, and found that uh, items were missing, TVs, that kind of stuff. Uh, if you have a rental property and you have it turned over to someone, I would make sure that you know who's going in and out of your home. Uh, the other was a property owner, um, who allowed service people into the house while they were not there. Um, I would not recommend doing that. If you've got work, I would be in your home while someone is, is there. Um, this past week, this past Sunday evening, uh, we had a bicycle accident, vehicle versus uh, pedestrian um, on Plantation Drive. So please use caution, uh, especially uh, in the nighttime cyclists we don't recommend riding a bicycle at night, but we do have that, and this one occurred somewhat late in the evening. Uh, the calls that we are experiencing here in the last month, um, I've, I've put this slide up to state law many times before. If you have a pet, your pet's required to stay on your property. It doesn't have to be on a leash on your property, but when it leaves your property, it has to be uh, tethered. Uh, we're we're having still having issues. Um, and if you open your door, your door up and just allow your animals to run around, then you're allowing your animal to, to roam at large. And I believe it's $880. So if you don't mind paying $880, because we are going to write you a ticket if we catch your animal off your property. Um, everyone loves their pets, but your neighbor may not like your pet. And unfortunately, that's what we're having going on in the club course area. There's people that don't want your pet on their property. And it's their right, and it's also the law. So please um, maintain your, your, your pets. Snakes, uh, if you live in the Heritage Road area, uh, we have been experiencing a large amount of uh, copperheads. Um, the, hopefully this cooler weather will run them inside. Um, I've had long conversations with David about this. I don't know if, a, 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 I've never really seen a snake trap work very well, uh, copperheads tend to, to den in the same areas year after year. If you have a lot of pine straw, I'd probably have your landscaper pull that back and just take a look. Uh, I think the last report, they've killed 16 just on the Heritage Road area. Um, so they, they definitely have a nest in the area, so be cautious. Uh, please plan for your deliveries. Uh, if you have, uh, if you're moving, having furniture delivered, make sure that you let your, your vendor know what where you live at, um, they can't bring a 55 tractor foot trailer into one of the T streets, Oceanside to deliver a rocking chair. Uh, so, so please make sure that they, that you let them know where you live and that there is some restrictions of, of getting it in here. Uh, you do have the ability, let them, they can use any of the power line right of ways and use a smaller truck to transport stuff in that, that seems to work pretty well for others who have used it in the past. So, uh, that is available to you. The scams, no one should be a scam 
victim anymore. If someone calls your home asking for something, you should probably think about that before you send a check in the mail. Uh, I don't know too many legitimate organizations that pick the phone up to call you and ask for your money. The holiday season seems to be a, a time where they're going after people where you, people are a lot seem to be a lot more generous in the holiday season. Uh, but there is all sorts of scams, the military donations where you're they're raising money for a, a military veterans. Uh, the scams are just they're all over. Um, but if they phone, the, the federal government's not going to have someone call you because you missed jury duty. I can't believe that anyone still falls for that today, but we do still have victims that fall for that. If you miss something for the government, they will send someone to arrest you. They're not going to call you. So <clears throat> please don't don't fall for that. Be very cautious over this season because they're, they're, they're out there. UPS, Amazon uh, deliveries, uh, the Postal Service, uh, I've gotten a couple of emails over the, of the last month. Uh, on Sundays, the United States Postal Service is delivering packages on Sunday. So you may come home and find a package that's been delivering. We're not restricting the post office from coming into Sea Pines, nor are we doing that for Amazon. Amazon is also delivering packages on Sundays. Uh, so we're Amazon, UPS, FedEx, they're kind of if they, their trucks pull up, we kind of let them in. Uh, they've not been restricted. I, Brett, I guess it's really been over the last year and a half that really the Postal Service, and I think it's just a matter of they don't have room for all the packages anymore. So they're delivering, and it's mainly have been packages and not really mail, uh, just trying to clear out the house. So we are allowing them in on uh, Sunday even, uh, Sundays. Um, electric bikes, uh, the policy has always been in Sea Pines that the um, um, anything that's a conveyance on the uh, pathways has to be self-propelled. Uh, we do have the electric bikes out there, the scooters. They're not permitted in, in Sea Pine. So if you have a rental property, if you would, um, and we are coming up with a, a new um, uh, information piece for uh, renters uh, to let them know you can't bring the electric scooters, the, the, the mopeds, that kind of stuff. So let your renters know that uh, that you can't bring your electric bikes here into Sea Pines. We're also notifying our local vendors that are dropping off bicycles for your renters uh, that they're not permitted here in, in Sea Pines. Uh, parties, I do appreciate those that are calling. If you're planning to have a holiday um, party, uh, be mindful of parking. The power lines are open. We will, I'll get with Russell, we'll take some of the, the fencing down to open those up. If you have a function and you want to utilize those, you're more than welcome to do that. If you have a party and they're going to park near your home, just make sure they're completely off the roadway to allow for emergency vehicle access. Uber Eats, uh, Grubhub, Instacart, we still have no contract with them. Uh, we literally are dealing with this on a daily basis. Um, I don't know what to tell you. I've, I've tried to call these, these companies to get someone from the corporate to, to work with us. We don't know who the drivers are. These are people in plane cars with no markings. We don't, we don't know any of them. And they go in Instacart and they're, they're going to pick up medication at CVS or your groceries and going to deliver it to your house. They get to the gate. It's $10. So that's, it's the price of commercial entry into sea pines. So we're, these people won't return any calls. I've sent emails. I don't know what else to do with this matter, but we have quite a few and we have two more companies that are coming online that's getting into the same delivery service. Um, illegal dumping, please let your landscaper know if you have a contractor, anyone that's doing work at your property, they are not permitted to dump debris at a CSA site. That is only for a property owner's use only and it's limited debris, uh, not, not roofing materials, not any of that kind of stuff. So please let anyone doing work at your, your property uh, know that. If you have a rental property and you purchase rental guest passes through CSA, I'm see how I'm put, if you owe us money, you need to pay us. <clears throat> Uh, we turned off 11 properties yesterday for failure to pay for rental passes. Uh, that includes both of your passes. You can't call in passes at all. So if you owe CSA money for the rental passes, please remit that. Uh, we, unfortunately, it is what it is. We have probably close to 30 properties that uh, have failed to pay for rental passes uh, to include some rental company management companies, and they have also been turned off as well. And lastly, 
Um, we don't have speeding traps and sea pines. If you see a patrol car, it's a trap. Every car we have is equipped with a radar that has the ability to take your speed, both coming and going. Uh, we don't hide in the bushes. Um, we're very plain. We're going to sit on Greenwood Drive. You made your corridors. If the car's pulled over inside the road, there's a good chance that officer's running radar. We're writing tickets. The last month, 66 tickets were written, and they weren't written for you doing the proper speed limit. People are speeding. You have to slow down. Um, I, I don't know what else to tell you. Uh, I can tell you that when you go to court and if you're found guilty, the tickets are very expensive. And we don't mind writing you one. But the tickets that we're writing are excessive speed. They're, they're 15 and 20 miles an hour above the posted speed limit. You got to slow down. Uh, I don't know what else to tell you. I mean, if the, the board decides that we were going to get out of the ticket business, then we'll let Sea Pines turn into a racetrack because that's what it is right now. So you've got to slow down and we're not getting it's officer discretion. So if you, if you get pulled over, you may get a warning out of it. You may get to go to court in Bluffton. It's going to be the officer's discretion, but the tickets have been very expensive, but we don't have speed traps. We're trapping every road. I'm telling you that now. So we're monitoring all that we can, but 66 tickets is excessive for, a, for and now we're not even in a rental season and we've got 66 tickets being written. So please, slow down because last thing you want is to be speeding and hit someone on the side of the roadway okay and with that happy holidays to you uh we will uh we've got a ada yes yeah, absolutely. Okay, so uh, ADA uh, equipment on pathways, wheelchairs, those kinds of things are permitted. Okay. Uh, with that, that concludes our uh, morning presentation. As I mentioned earlier, we're changing the format for this meeting. Uh, I'm going to be up here for questions. Russell, over on wherever you're going to be. Toby, David. Victoria, especially about bills, and uh, Amanda are all here for uh, questions. I'll be right up here. So you can do that at the board meeting. So we're not recording.